Hello there, I'm Mount Payne 27 and this is Sawed Off Wads, a Dean of Doom spin-off where we give grades to bite-sized classic and contemporary Doom wads. Why? Because ranking things is fun. Today we'll be covering 10 wads spanning 4 decades of Doom mapping, starting with the oldest and working our way forward. Without further ado, here's how the show works. Every map gets one grade for quality and one for difficulty. On the quality side, the grades go from A to F. Grade A levels are fun, memorable, visually distinctive, creative, and a fair challenge. Difficulty grades go from X to E, X for extreme, E for easy, A through D in between. Keep in mind, I probably won't have the same ideas about what makes a great level as you do, but that's okay. Disagreeing is part of the fun, after all. At the end of the day, this show is about spreading the joy of doom, so let's do so. Before we start, the rules are we play on ultra violence and must pistol start each level. I need to play the wads twice before reviewing them. Saves are allowed and we go for 100% kills in all levels, making exceptions when it's just not worth it. I play on Z-Doom with compatibility set to strict. Now, to the wads. First up, from 1994, Doomsday of UAC by Leo Martin Lim. One of Doom modding's most venerable and groundbreaking releases, Doomsday of UAC, also known as UAC Dead.Wad, is an E1M8 replacement set in an Indonesian UAC base circa 2010. To make a short backstory shorter, attacking demons just wrecked the armored truck that escorted you into the facility. It's your job to search the complex for survivors and evacuate them. UAC Dead actually predates Doom 2 by three months, which makes it older than I am, and that's pretty damn surreal. What Lim accomplishes with the most prehistoric Doom editors is nothing short of astonishing. The famous overturned truck is famous for a reason. The hood's popped open, the engine's on fire, the front wheels are still spinning, even the freaking headlights are still on. Surely UAC headquarters can't maintain this exhaustive standard of detail, you think? But behold, Lim decorates the place with bathrooms, modern architecture, a moving walkway, and this UAC sign by a blood fountain. On top of being a visual powerhouse for 94, UAC dead is quite playable. It's Doom 1, so we're limited to pinkies, imps, cacos, and shotgunners for the most part, but Lem managed to keep this jaded Doomer's attention. The chain gun trap would have been quite the scare for pre-Doom 2 players, and this demon conference room is a riot. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room! The switch behind the computer display opens a tunnel into the heart of the base's corruption, and yet another mapping miracle of yesteryear. This candle bridge and creepy descending corpse sequence are the first known occurrences of self-referencing sectors being used to create invisible platforms in Doom. With the BFG in hand, polishing off the immobile cyber demon should be no sweat. By now, it should be apparent that nobody's survived Hell's Onslaught, so with a clear conscience and the red skull key, make like a tree and get out of there. I played this map three times with no rose-colored glasses, and I come away more awed and deferential each time. No doubt about it, UAC Dead shows its age, but it's creative, moody, and downright inspiring. Grade B+, plus, difficulty D. Next on the docket is More Death, a 1997 partial conversion and the namesake project of Doom World co-founder Gaston Lahout. More Death is a short episode made up of six maps, starting with map one, Prelude to Damnation. More Death's statement of purpose, more or less, Prelude to Damnation is a secret rich castle map with lots of new greenery to showcase. It borrows barrels, chandeliers, and breakable gargoyle statues from Heretic, but the carefully coordinated texturing is all Doom 2. Not sure how Doom Guy's shades fit into the medieval setting, but I like that they fall off if you dip under 80 health. The combat isn't much to write home about, but Prelude's optional areas reward closer investigation. Climbing crates and shimmying along edges often leads to secrets, as does hopping through the fireplace and ducking through this gap in the wall. If you note this missing torch, you can even drop into a cell and meet your first custom monster of the campaign, the Flying Gremlin, or Wyvern, whatever. Once you find the blue key, you can leave the map whenever you like, but the appeal of Mordeath seems to lie in unearthing all of its mysteries, so do yourself a favor and stick around. Grade B, difficulty D-. Map 2, The Four Stairs. This swampy fortress gets off to a sprightly start, throwing a quarter of its forces at you in the first 60 seconds. The Four Stairs goes a bit heavy on caged foes for my liking, and makes me pine for a weapon upgrade. Don't get excited when you see these chain gunners, they're actually dehacked Wolfenstein SS, so they drop clips, but otherwise behave exactly like regular chain gunners. I have mixed feelings about this change. On one hand, I'm already sick of shotgunning stuff, but on the other, making the chain gun rarer increases its value, which is a pretty good idea. Same as the first map, you can leave without touching big sections of the four stairs, but there's an interesting twist ending if you find the secret yellow key. If you take it, Mordeth locks the exit until you go back to where you found the key and hit a switch. Use these cacos like clay pigeons, and the way is clear. 
Grade B, difficulty D. Map three, the House of Shadows. Mordeth takes an unexpectedly frustrating turn here, paring down its exploration and artificially cranking up the difficulty. House of Shadows is littered with chain gunners that don't drop chain guns and restricts you to the shotgun for most of the map. The pump action's limited range and damage output are no match for all these snipers and too weak to disperse as many beefy demons as Mordeth wants you to face at one time. Also, there's only one non-secret armor in the map, so you better make it count. Survive the throne room, steal the blue key, and press on this blue nub to open a teleporter, then be prepared for bullshit, because you're surrounded by hit scanners right after you teleport. After that, pick up the secret red key on the balcony and you'll finally reach the real chain gunners. As soon as you find one, it's pretty much open season on chain guns, and I resent being taunted after all that aggravation. On the plus side, the nature scenes continue to carry this set aesthetically, and I love little whiz bangs like this flame trap and this unexpected waterfall sound effect. The House of Shadows is a bit of a bummer after the more relaxing maps 1 and 2. Grade C, difficulty B-. Map 4, Babel by Gaslight. A handsome city covered in blankets of fog, Babel by Gaslight is the most combat-heavy map so far. Thankfully, the chain gun is available much earlier, making it substantially easier to deal with hit scanners. You can also get your paws on the first non-secret rocket launcher of the WAD, and my favorite Mordeth custom monster debuts here. The Ghoul Spawn is a pain elemental that creates green ghosts instead of lost souls. He replaces the Revenant and is far less dangerous, but his sprite edits and new attack are pretty neat. Two things about this map really bother me. This cookie cutter column room, which is low lit and full of red meat, and the yellow key segment, which comes right after it. When these demon-faced doors close behind you, you're locked in this block until you figure out what Lahout wants from you. Don't let him bully you into thinking you're crazy. Just find the key, fall into this mist-covered pit, hit the switch in the cage, and fight off the Mordeth monsters. A sadder switch that unblocks the doors will be revealed, and the exit's right up the street. You can't miss it. Grade C+, plus, difficulty B+. Plus. Map 5, Babel's Inner Quarter. This one can go either way. Stumble on the right goodies early enough and Babel's Inner Quarter will treat you well, but if you're stuck with low-rent weapons and overlook certain switches, it can devolve into a dismal drag. Platforming to this medieval air vent bags you a super shotgun and a berserk pack. It's so helpful I forgot where it was until the end of this playthrough and paid for it the entire time. Make note of this red switch in the crate room as you'll have to come back for it. I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure what it does, but there are two red switches in this map and one of them's gotta raise the red bars in front of the exit. Of that, I am sure. The second one is much more painful to reach on account of these slow elevators. Coupled with this music, it brings back bad memories of playing downtown. Compared to the rest of the WAD, Babel's inner quarter is miserly with space and hard to navigate. This is one more death map I don't recommend forcing yourself to 100%. I had a lot more fun the first time when I let myself leave as soon as I got bored. Grade B-, difficulty C. Footnote, I really like the idea of placing movable barrels and breakable gargoyles in front of supplies, and I'm surprised I haven't seen this done more often. Map 6, the Draconic Guardians. Probably the most complete map in more death, the Draconic Guardians marries the episode's city and wetland themes and features the best balance of combat and exploration in the WAD. Mordeth exclusive monsters represent in record numbers here, especially the flying gremlins who are great fun to blow apart with a super shotgun. This double barrel is also a secret, but it's easier to find than the one in map 5. You may have noticed, but this map is giving you an awful lot of rockets. Twice as many as the rest of the WAD combined, in fact, so it should come as no surprise when this happens. Meet Mordeth's Bruiser Brothers, a pair of mancubus fireball belching badasses with the health pools of spider demons. One swamp dragon guards the blue key, and the other guards the switch that lowers it. Keep the rockets coming, don't get cocky, and they should go down without much fanfare. With its absorbing scenery and flashy unveiling of Mordeth's signature foe, the Draconic Guardians is a high note to end on. Grade B+, difficulty C. And that's it. Despite teasing a space-themed episode 2 in its Map 7 story text, Mordeth's sequel is infamous for technically still being in development, now 25 years later. It's a running joke on Doomworld that high-profile projects with long development cycles are given the Mordeth Award and this WAD's dubious honor. To be able to generate such anticipation, even if it turned to chagrin, is quite a feat, and I think it would be pretty big news even today if Mordeth E2 suddenly came out. For E1's part, I'd say the hype was justified in 1997, the extensive dehacked, tasteful scenery and solid adventure gameplay make for a pleasant afternoon playthrough. My final grade for more death is a B- with a final difficulty grade of D+. With too few maps to choose from, we'll pass on the Dean's list and move right on to the next terminal. Our next WAD from 2001 is Null Space by Russell Pearson. At this formative stage in the Sawed Off WAD series, Doomworld's 100 Most Memorable Maps list has been one of my go-to resources for short WAD material. Null Space placed 35th on that list, just above Ancient Aliens Leave Your Soul Behind 
behind, with Doom Rider Demon of the Well calling it the granddaddy of the Voidscape map theme. After playing it twice, I've concluded that Null Space is one of the weakest picks on Doom World's list, and in this review I'll try to explain why. Null Space's anti-landscape views are its primary draw. The sight of a brick-and-mortar fortress suspended in oblivion is impressive and uncanny, no doubt doubly so at the turn of the millennium. However, Pearson doesn't use the Void nearly as much as this screenshot would have you believe. The truth is, you'll barely have enough time with the Abyss to do a staring contest. Meanwhile, the fortress interiors are workmanlike and monochromatic, struggling to retain interest for the half hour or more it takes to exit. These drab aesthetics don't get any help from the gameplay, which for my money is the real letdown of Null Space. The first ten minutes are a totally forgettable shotgun slog against thicker foes than you ought to be facing. Then there's about two minutes of excitement when you cross the Void Bridge while being chased by Kako's Arachnotrons and Revenants, and there's one more burst of action when the Archviles arrive. Other than that, more like Dull Space. Pearson's ammo stringency discourages you unloading on anything but Archviles, even if you find all six of his obscure secrets. Don't waste munitions on these caged imps until cleanup time, which, can we get a sound effect for monster window dressing? <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to give the final fight props for being suitably dramatic, but if you don't attack and just keep feeding enemies to the Cyber Demon, it plays out like one of those old Doom Gladiator episodes. That was pathetic. Watch Goat Boy kill everything, tap him with the BFG, and the map is over. Even giving priority to Null Space's visuals, it's a long and neutral playthrough today. Modern players like myself are unlikely to see why Doom World recommends it so highly. I guess it just had to be there. Grade C+, difficulty C+. If today's episode had a theme, it would be the epic map. And to this day, few Doom levels have come as close to capturing the definition of epic as 2004's Deus Vault by Wee Fam. The flamboyant, hyper hyperbolic and unhinged Deus Vault was Wee Fam's mapping debut, a gargantuan kitchen sink of ideas, references, and carnage. DV.wad comes with five maps. The first four are just subsections of map five, Deus Vault, made to accommodate lower NPCs of its day. The full version hosts almost 3,000 monsters, including two Plutonias of Revenants, 300 Barons of Hell, 66 Cyberdemons, and 219 Archviles. There are more Archviles in this map than there are monsters in Go To It. Deus Vault earned its number two spot on Doom World's 100 Most Memorable Maps with shock value. Plain and simple, its titanic architecture, searing colors, dizzying thematic shifts, and devastating difficulty made it totally unique in its day. It's widely considered to be a landmark map whose megatonnage nobody in the community has topped before or since. However, if I may, I would like to cast a dissenting vote. Deus Vault sucks. I have never seen a map so in need of revision, bankrupt of restraint, and inconsiderate of the player's time. Citadel at the Edge of Eternity would look at Deus Vault and say, dude, really? If Magical was an actual sadist, then Wee Fam is a megalomaniac. Everything about this map screams, tremble before me, as if the Eye of Sauron he so casually assimilates is meant to be his stand-in. The only trembling I experienced playing Deus Vault was brought on by anger, especially my second time through. After the wow factor wears off, you realize just how long and meaninglessly painful this map is. I think making this recording put me through the stages of grief. Within the first hour, I wanted to quit and raged like I haven't raged at Doom in a long time. Then I took a break and tried to make myself believe it would get better when I came back, but it didn't. Soon, I fell into an indifferent silence and accepted my fate. I think Deus Vault's spectacle leads people to make excuses for its gameplay. Under all the glitz and glamour is a flawed, mercurial, and agonizing experience. Most of Fom's fights are just huge, haphazard teleport ambushes, or plain Jane corridors choked with barons, archviles, and monsters that pop up in front of you and poof in behind you, but his favorite trick by far is to hand you an invulner for and blow blitz an arena with foes whilst you surf and BFG. Fom relies on this setup so much that it becomes dull and redundant. Personally, I think he lacked the creativity and or patience to engineer his desired level of madness without them. Ironically, he only gives you one for the red cave section, which is f***ing excruciating. Endless sniping revenants, prowling archviles, sneaky chain gunners, and that stupid hawk-eyed cyberdemon who must have dialed me up long distance 20 times in this playthrough. You're sure to BFG, constantly under fire from enemies you 
can't physically see or shoot because they're too high above you, slumming through bland tunnels and picking off flocks of sniper revenants and archies four rockets at a time because you gotta wait 10 seconds between salvos for all the projectiles coming from a mile away to slam into the wall. If this was the entire map, I'd fail it in a heartbeat. From there, Deus Vault is a smorgasbord of miscalibrated monster mashes, pointless cyber demons, archfile splurges, long elevators, alien vendetta spoofage, and 30 secrets, which are alternately pointless, juvenile, critical, dated, and bizarrely self-indulgent. You can literally run circles around the final fight, which gives me one more thing to rag on this map about. Deus Vault's pacing is all over the place. The energy peaks during the Invuln Chapel fight, which arrives two-thirds of the way into the map, and seems to be less climactic than the Battle of Isengard. <laughs> Shut up. I did not need to play Deus Vault twice. We Fam's unedited ego trip will appeal to slaughter junkies and the more impressionable lads and lasses out there, but it's equally likely to pound you into a pulp until you are unable to appreciate the drama it's trying to summon. It would be pretty funny if I said Deus Vault shall not pass, but it does have some redeeming qualities, so grade D, difficulty X. The next epic map on the docket is 2010's Jade Earth by Jodwin. No map has ever made me feel underground quite like Jade Earth. Earth. Set in a supermassive UAC mountain base buried as deep as humans dig, Jade Earth tells a familiar story of hubris and its consequences. All along your white-knuckled warpath, you'll be haunted by the discarded bodies of your comrades in arms. If you don't want to join them, you'll need to screw your courage to the sticking place, because it's dark down here, and you're not alone. If my prologue hasn't already given it away, Jade Earth's calling card is Dread. Few maps can match its raw trepidation. Jodwin doesn't make a serious attempt on your life for almost half an hour, but Jade Earth's slow burn builds anticipation, making its crescendos all the more terrifying. It helps that Jodwin chose the perfect midi for his opus, Mark Clem's Organic Gods is nothing short of miraculous. It's not my favorite track of his, but it might be his most commanding. It's eight minutes of existential terror that lurks, churns, and surges along with Jade Earth so well it feels like it was written for it. And here comes the breakdown. time. So combat-wise, Jade Earth measures modestly on the Richter scale. Jodwin makes no attempt to reinvent the wheel, scattering dozens of small encounters across his map's two-hour runtime. His occasional large-scale ambushes rarely exceed 30 foes. This Revenant crate room fight is the first encounter that seems designed to push you. It dealt me my first death in both of my playthroughs. Jodwin is fond of perched hit scanners and regularly mixes in arch files with the Revenants, Hell Knights, and Imps he uses as foot soldiers. So anxious does the ebb and flow of ammo make me, I'd ring a kitten neck for a berserk pack, but Jodwin doesn't give you one, not even in a secret. Speaking of which, good luck with those, I went two for ten. Jodwin starts amping things up around the time you get the yellow key, with this heated encounter around the midway point being one of Jade Earth's scariest. About 600 monsters in, you'll drop into a dig site scattered with corpses and duke it out with two cyber demons for the red key. The low visibility and your shot nerves make this fight a lot harder than you'd expect. The trip back is an obstacle course of mancubi, revenants, and archfile punctuations. Take a tense elevator ride back up, dismantle a mastermind with its caco cronies, and get ready for the grand finale. If you've been saving rockets and cells for a special occasion, this is it. Letting the plasma rip after two hours of skulking around is cathartic as all hell and compensates for the final fight being anticlimactic. Jade Earth is a very long map and doesn't curry to 100%ers, but it's a must-play for adventure seekers or those looking to immerse themselves in a doom-made world. It's sumptuously crafted, occasionally jaw-dropping, and irradiated with evil. Grade A minus, difficulty A minus. Next up, um, you know what? Actually, I'm not mentally prepared for this one right now. Let's instead skip to 2018's Man on the Moon by Yugi Boy 85 You'd be hard-pressed to find a map more up my alley than Man on the Moon. It's an homage to Valiant's Lunar episode, authored by a Tangerine Nightmare contributor, and it shares its soundtrack with the equally expansive deep space epic Fomal Hout from THT Threnody. Man on the Moon is an hour-long adventure that feels like 15 minutes owing to Yugi Boy 85s penchant for propulsive action and his fluid, excessive layout. Don't be put off by the enormous kill count. A large majority of the enemies are zombies and imps tailor-made for detonation. Like the Jackson Pollock of Doom, Yugi Boy paints the floor with jibs. Man on the Moon is uniformly excellent, at pretty much my Goldilocks level of challenge. Not too easy, not too abusive, 
just right. There's an entire episode's worth of encounters in here that hit the sweet spot for me. That several of them are kept secret is probably my only complaint with this map. The square off of the secret plasma kicks ass, the secret megasphere in the yellow key area is blocked by a wall of juicy meat, and the optional green arena en route to the BFG is another throwdown you won't want to miss. Not that the standard progression is lacking in any way, mind you. The red key path is a slick and color-coordinated rocket fest, the blue key corridor will quickly swamp you if you don't break through one of these collapsing fronts, and the yellow key segment goes from Skillsaw-esque archvile tactics puzzle to thunderous cliffside bombardment. The finale is the most choreographed encounter in the map, a multi-part extravaganza that ladles on the danger, packing cyber demons, pinky brigades, revenants, mancubi, and archviles into a collapsing cavern brawl. Armor, cells, and power-ups are abundant, but the risk of instant death never gets higher than here. Unexpectedly, Yugi Boy also introduces a single custom enemy into the fray, the Terminator, who's essentially a spider mastermind that also shoots revenant rockets. He's ideal for distracting cyber demons in the closing minutes. What impresses me most about Man on the Moon is how well it compares to the influences it wears so clearly on its sleeve. Yugi Boy is no mere skill saw imitator. He takes the master's slaughter light signature and splatter paints on a bigger canvas, invests deeply in his visuals, and makes it all flow together better than almost any magnum opus I've played. I had been thirsting for a pure fun map, and Man on the Moon was the tall drink of water I needed. Grade A+, difficulty A-. Next on the docket from 2019, Darkest Room by Paul977. I'm drawn like a moth to flame by green maps of mystery, and like the moth, I get burnt to a crisp. Probably the most well-known map by Italian designer Paul977, Darkest Room has a rich and esteemed lineage, inheriting the aesthetic chops and strict tactical gameplay of four mapping wonderkins, BPRD, Darkwave, Death, Destiny, and Ribix. The latter two taught Paul the art of combat, and the former two inform his art style. But Paul himself seems especially fascinated with two things, monster infighting and pain elementals. His four doomed senseis are also infatuated with them, but nobody loves meatballs quite like the Italian. For perspective, Darkest Room has as many pain elementals as Disturbia, despite being one-sixth its size, and pain elementals are five times more common in Darkest Room than in God Machine, the home of possibly the most memorable pain elemental set piece in Doom history. Speaking of Ribic's creations, Darkest Room borrows and slightly modifies the weak cyber demon seen in Magnolia. They only have 700 health, but since they replace the spider demon, they can absorb splash damage. As you play Darkest Room, you'll notice that Paul frames almost every fight one of two ways. He either jump scares you, or he shows you exactly what's coming and lets you take your time figuring out what to do. He makes extensive use of death enemies, forcing the player to think about sight lines and how best to get monsters killed without using guns. Paul's combat ethos can be summarized in two fights. This early room with one Revenant, one Green Cyber, two Arch Files, and a Hell Knight with two Arachnotrons blocking your escape is the prototypical jump scare. You're surrounded by a skeleton crew of carefully positioned area deniers, and you have to either escape quickly or survive long enough to neutralize threats from scariest to puniest. The second type of fight is best exemplified by this control room encounter. The key here is to get everything to die without firing a shot, which would wake up these four arch files. Nudge the Hell Knights, get him to hit the Cyber Demon, and then use his dumbass to initiate some fatal miscommunications. Of course, Paul washes all that down with a flock of pain elementals, and I wouldn't recommend keeping the Cyber alive for that like I did here. <laughs> Darkest Room is like an exam. If you don't prepare for it, you can probably wing most of it. But the hardest question that counts for the most points is liable to f you up at the end. If you're out of cells going into the final fight, prepare to try again, fail again, and fail better. In this one room, I died 85 times. The crisscross of rockets, revenant fireballs, and sniping arch files is demoralizing. Without the BFG, you're dodging warheads on hair-thin margins and returning fire with only a blunderbuss for about 30 seconds, which, needless to say, is too long. My point is, if you play Darkest Room, do not waste cells. Paul 977's cutthroat approach should please challenge seekers, but I don't need a double shot of cold Rebixian murder to get my doom fix. Grade A minus difficulty X. Next up, from everybody's favorite year, the one and only Gateway to Shangri La by Zolganoth. Ah, yes, the notorious Fire Blue map bitrate killer, and great-great-grandson of Mount Erebus. Gateway to Shangri-La is unique in that it's the first map I've played for Dean of Doom whose inception and development I witnessed firsthand. Over the course of several months, Shangri-La snowballed from a novelty idea into a fully-fledged map with custom graphics provided by Zolganoth's collaborator, Anarchy. The latter's comprehensive collection of textures and sprites is almost as much of an accomplishment as the map itself. Zolganoth also commissioned a MIDI from Stuart Wren, who sounds like he was right in the middle of composing for Heartland with this driving, psychedelic 
tune. Underneath its gimmicky facade, Gateway to Shangri-La is not only functional, but full of personality. For example, Zogonoth's orgiastic use of boom light cycles verges on sunlust parody, but it's also a tactical choice. The high contrast, low lighting, and projectile color alterations make combat more difficult than it should be in some scenarios, but never to the point of unfairness, except in the case of Spectres, who are completely invisible in OpenGL. The map is made up of very discreet encounters, padded out with a lot of arch files, which tend to appear whenever you backtrack, pick up important items, hit critical switches, or take your hand off the mouse to scratch your nose. This barrel hallway is my favorite Archie set piece in the WAD, an idea borrowed from AD-79's Ancient Aliens map. Each of the barrels blocks an archvile teleport spot, so you have to watch your fire and manage imp projectiles while carefully fending off the Martians that inevitably appear. I also love this arena fight. It's neat looking, explosive, and clever, punishing players who kill the Revenant snipers too early with Cyberdemon turrets. Shangri-La's most memorable encounter is unfortunately my least favorite. I call it the OCD fight, and it's not hard to see why. To keep from being fried Sunlust Map 29 style, you have to keep pressing switches that raise walls to the left or right of you. You can't stand still because they lower in a few seconds. Meanwhile, you need to be pressing other switches around the room, fighting off teleporting foes, and keeping up with your OCD ritual. It's anxiety inducing. The Hell Knight round stresses me out the most, but the Cyber Demon at the end is pretty scary too. Even if you get the vials to infight him, it can be a tall order to find cover immediately after he dies. There's no worse feeling than smash smashing the spacebar and not hearing the familiar <coughs> Props to Zolganoth for his ingenuity, but the OCD fight is just too finicky and paranoia-inducing for me to enjoy. Gateway to Shangri-La caps off on a massive imp and revenant purge. BFG like crazy, watch your health, and you should come out okay. I have to appreciate Zolganoth's audacity. Despite the tongue-in-cheek premise, he plays Shangri-La with a straight face. Whether or not you like his style, he packs a lot of value into every fight. His visuals, hard on the eyes as they are, surpass memedom, and he's got a more clearly defined artistic vision than some mappers who've been at this for decades. Grade A minus, difficulty A plus. <sighs> All right, now that I'm mentally prepared and fully warmed up, let's come back to the main event. From 2013, Swim with the Whales by Zachary Ribix Stevens. This ultra-challenging set needs no introduction. If you find yourself playing this wad, you're hip deep in doom addiction. I think these maps speak for themselves. So let's dive right into map one, the deep end. Without any monsters to fight, there's not much to do here but take in the blue quiescence. If you're thirsty, you can pick up two health bonuses, and whenever you're ready, platform over to the light blue key to release the exit. Overall, a very short and pretty scene setter that needs no mark for difficulty. Grade B+. Map two, Ride the Dolphins. More so than Star Stardate 20XD6, Swim with the Whales chiseled Ribic's aesthetic into our brains. Above all, his architecture is unyielding and alien. Splashes of blue stand out against the stone, metal, and darkness. The naked contrast makes his environments all the more foreign and intimidating. It feels strange describing what makes Ribix's maps distinctive looking, because being in his world is such an unmistakably cold, discomforting, and lonely experience it hardly needs explaining once you've entered it. Of course, Ribix also optimizes his abstract battlegrounds for pain. Not a single room in Ride the Dolphins feels within my ability to autopilot, and it's just the warm-up for the next map. The trouble starts in the opening room. Without a game plan, it can be frustrating. Scoop up the super shotgun, Ride these columns up to the chain gun, press the switch, run for the rocket launcher, and get the hell out. Negotiating monster crossfires is a vital ingredient in Ribix's secret sauce. You're wasting health and ammo attacking head-on if you can force infighting. Case in point, this dicey two-part encounter with chain gunners, imps, and revenants, then hell knights, imps, arch files, and a spider mastermind. Decide carefully when to pull the trigger because it's hard enough to avoid damage in this room without arch files hunting you. Sometimes Ribix leaves you no choice but to fight, and that's when things get hairy. This brutal two-tiered encounter gives you neither enough time to start profitable infighting below, nor enough space to avoid the arch files, homing rockets, and hungry cacos everywhere else. Luckily, I outsmarted it by plunging in with the last 10 seconds of a secret involve. If you're having trouble with certain fights, look for secrets. They're hard to find, but worth it. Another unavoidably offensive fight is this wacky cyberdemon arena. If they step on blue vents, they teleport to the periphery and conveyor belt around before warping back in unexpectedly. This isn't a fun fight if you're playing saveless, but I kinda like it. This optional bridge fight, on the other hand, can bite me. If the cyber chooses not to shoot, 
loot, or if auto-aim doesn't help you with the revenants, or if you didn't leave yourself enough lateral space to dodge rockets when it's down to you and Mr. Saib, you are screwed. Ride the Dolphins has its foibles, but it's a fundamentally excellent and mostly enjoyable map that transitions beautifully into the headliner. Grade A, difficulty X-. Map 3, Swim with the Whales. If you choose to play Swim with the Whales, you're gonna learn something about yourself. It doesn't matter if you're playing with saves or not. This map is a test of willpower, patience, and intestinal fortitude. Of all the epics I've played today, Swim with the Whales is the lowest kill count by a long shot, capping out at just 92 revenants, 40 odd archfiles, and 16 cyberdemons. Nonetheless, it's even more lethal than Deus Vault pound for pound. Nothing is for free in this map. You're constantly walking a tightrope with ammo, skirting past sniper surveillance, and taking psychological damage from this midi. Holy sh**, does this get harrowing after a while. Swim with the Whales starts much the same as Dolphins did, forcing you to play creatively with infighting and dig yourself out of holes with secret hunting, but before long, Ribix shifts things into a different gear entirely. See for yourself. Just 28 seconds in this Hanoi pit of hell is enough to drive a person crazy. It's a complete roll of the dice that can kill you even if you play as accurately as humanly possible. It's a blatantly awful fight, one of the dumbest and cruelest doom stages I've ever survived. That being said, it took me twice as many attempts to beat this room. If you try to lure the barons and cyberdemons outside, the revenants and archfiles will absolutely violate you. If you don't save enough cells to kamikaze your way through the baron blockade and then expertly down the cybers, you're going to die here over and over and over. After death number 70, Mount Payne experienced its largest eruption in recent memory. If you choose to play Swim with the Whales, you're gonna learn something about yourself. I kid you not, I almost threw in the towel here, drew a line in the sand and said, that's it. I don't ever need to experience Swim with the Whales or anything beyond it. But I gave it a day, dug in, and finished the map. Twice. I'm not sure if that's a triumph of the human spirit or if I'm just one stubborn mother but I do know one thing. I got some anger issues. Anyway, if you want to see this map's ending, I highly recommend you 1. Find the secret black key, which allows you to telefrag the world's worst cyber sniper and bypass some horrible platforming. You get it by completing some horrible platforming. 2. Save rockets if you want to get 100% kills. The Hell Knight and Revenant cupboards do not crush their occupants when you finish the Cyberdemon Corral, which makes for an awkward, unnecessary cleanup. 3. Just open Doom Wiki and have it in front of you, because the secrets are all critical and they're nigh on impossible to find blind. There's no going back once you enter this teleporter, so get your house in order before you step through. The final fight is pure nightmare fuel. Mancubus trenches, Revenant snipers, a mastermind, a fountain of lost souls, six or seven roaming Cyberdemons, and a dispersion of arch files that reignites the party in stomach plummeting fashion. This cozy corner is a windbreak in the middle of a borderline impossible fight to beat straight up. If you budget your cells and make careful runs at the sniping vials, then polish off the cybers, you can eke out a Pyrrhic victory. Swim with the Whales demands even the best players be in top form to attempt it, and even then it's unfathomably merciless, radiating malice, utter scorn. I was not in peak form when I played Swim with the Whales, and I will never reach a point where it's manageable for me. It surpasses my upper threshold for pain tolerance, and being something of a masochist when it comes to doom, that means a lot coming from me. Swim with the Whales is definitionally unfair, callous, and vitriolic. Grade B-. Difficulty X+. Plus. Map 31, question mark, question mark, question mark. This short and gimmicky bonus map should have been called Narwhal, because it's goofy and kinda small compared to its fellows. It's essentially four fights which can be tackled in any order you like. You only get three blueberry orbs and one azure armor after the Megasphere at the start, so spend them wisely. This cyberdemon hallway that floods with imps and hell knights is smothering, tetchy, and generally unpredictable. Definitely the hardest fight here. With all three keys, you can activate the Satter switch on the back of this column, hew down an army of zombies, 
zombie men with a fresh BFG and try not to catch rockets in the remaining cybers. Dinky, enjoyable, and blue daba dee daba die. Grade B plus, difficulty A. Okay then, I think we've earned a wind down, so let's wrap up today's Sawed Off Watts episode with a fun little map from this year called The Old Bean Factory by KWC. Hell has taken over, and all you want is a can of those damned beans. An offhand recommendation in the goofy title attracted me to this whimsical Otex adventure, and I'm lucky I found it. Bean Factory's action is hardly cutting edge, but it's downright pleasant, accessible, and laugh out loud funny. The map is pretty linear and unremarkable progression wise, but it's brimming with adorable details that keep things fresh. I especially love these crates, this donut, the gory mess hall, and this beautiful console, controller, and TV set. The old bean factory is a rare map in that it's worth playing solely for shits and giggles. Literally. I don't think this Baron knows what it <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Boss Baron knows how toilets work. KWC's references, fourth wall breaks, and moments of unapologetic, crude humor work better than they have any right to, but his secrets are also genuinely creative and rewarding, best exemplified by the gun store, which can be accessed by paying close attention to its advertising. There's another secret that knocks it out of the park very close by, but I don't want to spoil it, so I'll give you a hint instead. The hint is this. What's the deal with shootable switches? After swimming with whales and deucing volts, the old bean factory is child's play, and I don't see much rhyme or reason for the gray pinkies and color adjustments, but I dig the sped up chain gun and the blue key replacement, which is of course, a can of those damned beans. Props to KWC for an immensely entertaining half hour. I'm excited to see what he does next. Grade B+, difficulty C-. So. That's another episode of Sawed Off Wads in the Books. Once again, this was a really fun episode to put together, and I'd love to hear some Sawed Off recommendations from you guys, because my list is pretty depleted after this episode. Before we close, I'd like to thank my TA, Neurometry, for suggesting more death in the old bean factory, and for goading me into playing Swim with the Whales for this episode. If you're watching this, you owe me a new keyboard, buddy. The following maps deserve special recognition with honor roll status. Jade Earth by Jodwin, Man on the Moon by Yugi Boy 85 Darkest Room by Paul977, Gateway to Shangri-La by Zolganoth, and Ride the Dolphins by Ribix. Thank you all very much for watching, and please feel free to share your thoughts on the wads down below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll heart your comments to let you know I've read them. Now, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my generous patrons. Aaron Allen, Agile Jackson, Agu XYZ, Alec Wehrman, Alex M, Alex Topfer, Bo Higginbotham, Beatbeard, Ben Barrett, Birdburn, Brother JG, Builder Sith, Bitefire, Kappa Bitch, Captain Wave, Collie Bluefin, Cheese Wheel, Chris Dufet, Chris O'Neill, Christopher Hart, Christophine Place, Dan, Dave Davidson, Delirium, Do To Yourself, Dorothy Miller, Egg Boy, Ember, Emma Essex, Faithful, Felix Wilson, Francis T218, General Roasterock, Glenn Marmon, Griffin Upchurch, Hyak Show, In Captivity, Jeff Hibbert, Jeff Shirilla, Jose Ballestero, Josh Ballard, Jude, Just Some Schmuck, Just Great 98, Camille Bernadotte, Killplane, Leon Staten, Logan Lazalba, Mark Rowland, Master Drew 117, Matt, Matthew Gower, Michael Akins, Mixer, MK2021, Moko Mothman MM47, Mosicon, Myolvin, Nafferty, Neurometry, Knights 108, Number 26, NX Avery, Omnibot, Orion Burke Poole, Painful Hill 72, Pezabang Zhaj, Philip Coffee, Pixel Perfect PT, Pyro Shi, Randy A, Reese, Rune, Sean Doherty, Sega Monkey, Sid Menon, Space Clanka, Spinner 8, Stonemason, Stupid Nick, Sylvester Priss, Tara Kushino, The Cloptologist, The Dinosaur Heretic, TJG1289, Trilby Trillion, Turbine 2K5, Ultra Cow, YBMO Not a Crab, and William Huber. Thank you. I appreciate you all very much. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you again in Dean of Doom Season 3.